Thank you all so much for joining us today, and hello to everyone who may be online. Um, I'm Lisa Biggs, and it's really an honor to be uh, sharing the stage with this distinguished group of poets, scholars, visionary writers, um, community leaders today here at Brown. Um, as Stephanie said, we're going to really just dive into the poetry first and then move into a conversation amongst the artists on stage. Um, I wanna take a moment to thank CSREA for gathering us together and for continuing to do such groundbreaking and important work um, to create space for people to have these important conversations um, and to really center the role of art and artists in our society. And we are definitely a group that gets overlooked in conversations about human care about um, human safety, about justice and equity. And we have a tremendous amount to share um, with each other and with our worlds. Uh, people don't make poetry usually or exclusively to um, unpack a question in their own lives. Sometimes people do, or to confront a hard truth or to understand something. Uh, the people who are sitting on stage here do that work and then they also work to share their ideas with others um, so that they can have a larger conversation amongst us as human beings about this lived experience that we are going through. So um, I'm gonna introduce people one at a time and invite them to um, share their work and then um, afterward we'll sit down and have a, I'll have a, a brief conversation. So um, it's my honor and my privilege to begin the event uh, by introducing Mary Kim, Mary Kim Arnold a writer, artist, and teacher, she's the author of The Fish and the Dove, Poems, and Litany for a Long Moment. A transnational, transracial, Korean-born adoptee, her text and textile work explore themes of hybridity, dislocation, racial and cultural identity, and gender. She serves as senior editor for collaborative and cross-disciplinary texts at Tupelo Quarterly, Arnold is a Brown alumna and former faculty in the nonfiction writing program. Please join me in welcoming Mary Kim Arnold. Okay. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's such an honor to be sharing the stage with these poets and artists. Um, I'm going to do two things. I am going to read from this book, and then I'm going to do a little experiment um, that I guess I'll tell you about in a minute. I'm just trying to figure out the best order the experiment or the other thing. I guess I'll do the uh, other thing first and then do the experiment. Um, so this, uh, this book is called The Fish and the Dove um, and it really came about as a result of some of the reading I was doing for the um, sort of extended meditation on a failed search for my birth family. Uh, I ended up reading a lot about the Korean War and um, thinking a lot about the place or the absence of women in war narratives um, and a bunch of other intersecting things. And one of the um, characters that simultaneously caught my eye was the, uh, a myth of the Assyrian goddess Semiramis, who is said to have been um, orphaned child of a goddess and a fish. So this is for um, her, the fish and the dove, Semiramis cycle. The queen takes the throne by force. Ambition makes her beautiful, her sweat-soaked gown, blood on the tip of every sword. Usurper, pretender, Imposter, the men whisper and hiss at her, but she has their eyes plucked out, gathers them up in her skirts the way she carried blueberries to her father as a child. Later at the altar, she lays the silver bowl down, washes her hands in a basin of holy water, then tips it out on the stone floor, orders the sightless men to their knees to lap the water up. Defiling something is one way to make it yours. 
It is said that when she was young, she licked all the ripest fruits laid out on the table, and who would dare touch them after that? Semiramis was someone to write operas about. Imagine a woman wielding power. Imagine a woman on the ancient throne, beautiful and ruthless. If we are going to be ruled by a woman, at least let her be a whore. It turns them on to think of her, the historians, I mean. Year after year, one bloody battle after another. But what's this? A sexy lady coming down the annals of time? Power fits her differently than the men who came before. She wraps herself in the blood-soaked garments, prances around, but all the blood in the ocean will not bring her mother back. Men claim she is not fit for the throne. Does she fear death? She does. Does she fear love? Do not cross her. Respect and admiration are not the same as fear, though their effects look the same in certain lights. Standing where powerful men have stood before is powerful, clawing at the palace draperies with your own unwashed hands. If at the point of your spear men cultivate land for you, is the land yours? If it is their blood that soaks the earth but by your hand that they bleed, does the earth too become yours? Her father slain, her mother left to throw herself to the sea. They say she killed a thousand men, they say she loved a thousand more, straddled and rode them to the gated walls of the city, urged them all in. Is love not a kind of battle? Is battle not a strike of love? If you can't control it, kill it, she has been known to say. Some say she slayed them all, so that none would mistake her body's hunger for more than what it was. A woman cannot afford affection when she has an empire to run. Don't say you have never used another for your pleasure. Don't say you have never wished it had all gone another way. Um, so I, whenever I have an opportunity to um, do something live, I like to set myself a little task of doing something I haven't done before and re-contextualize uh, work a little bit. So if we could um, start the video, I'll be reading some from this book, but interacting with um, these images in a different way. And um, this is called Forgotten War, um, which as you may know, um, in the US, the Korean War is often referred to as the Forgotten War. So let me see if this will work so I can just. Uh, would you mind just starting it again? I'm so sorry. <laughs> No war is forgotten to those who lived through it. On screen, men are always marching, or refugees in white plod away from the burning city men marching in mud and then in snow. Missiles hurtle toward the earth, then blow it open. What is it I am looking for? On screen, a baby in a wooden cart. This is not me. Men held naked at gunpoint. This is not me. Piles of the dead abandoned in a roadside ditch. Not me, not mine, not my war, and yet one must choose sides, it seems. You are brave or you are the enemy. You stand and fight. You fight or die. You die fighting. My mother was a child of this war. She blurs my vision.
Is it useful to ask, who is the enemy, or where do I belong? Useful to lay claim to someone else's suffering, to keep watching this endless march through mud and snow, through winter so cold it froze the wounded as they fell, their arms raised and reaching. Not useful, not mine, not now, not while, all this death keeps piling up in my name. All the documentaries in the world will not bring my mother back. It's not bitterness if it's true. This is a rule I just made up. When the president abandoned the city, he left behind what he no longer needed. Golf balls, oyster knives, gold-rimmed teacups, wreckage for people to pick through. Orphans who clogged the streets were just another problem to solve, and here I am still looking for signs, still looking for reasons, trying to freeze the frame to find my mother looking out at me from the ruins, my own face looking back. A devout childhood spent on my knees, I feared that at night a demon would possess me, so I would pray to the Virgin Mother to fill me so full of grace that there would be no room left anywhere in me for anything else to enter. One must choose sides, it seems. At night, I spoke the names of saints aloud, remembered my old novenas, fell asleep to the sounds of my own fear. Vigilance is one way to keep my mother alive. You are brave or you are the enemy. You love it or you leave it. You stand and fight, you fight and die, you die fighting. You can stay up all night counting the missing and still not know who you are. You can open your mouth to speak, but still not know your own name. Thank you so much for that offering, that sharing, that centering. I um, meant to say in my um, introduction that one of the things that we agreed that we would do on stage is as each um, poet shared their work that we would kind of take mental notes about those moments or phrases or ideas or images that stuck with us so that we could return to them and talk about them collectively. I want to invite you all to do the same, to take moments, uh, to notice moments in the texts and the sharings that uh, stand out to you, so that when we um, turn the converse, we open the conversation up, that um, you can uh, draw upon those things as well as if you would like to. Next, um, I want to introduce uh, Matthew Shinoda. Matthew Shinoda is a writer, professor, author, and editor. His poems and essays have appeared in newspapers, journals, radio programs, and anthologies. Come on in, folks. Come on in. His debut collection of poems, Somewhere Else, won a 2006 American Book Award. He's also the author of Seasons of Lotus, Seasons of Bone, editor of Duppy Conqueror, New and Selected Poems by Kwame Dawes, 
author of, okay, am I saying this right? Tahrir Street? Tahrir Street? All right, close. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. I appreciate it. I'll keep working on it. Tahrir, Tahrir Street poems, which was the winner of the 2015 Arab American Book Award, and with Kwame Dawes, editor of Bearden's Odyssey, Poets Respond to the Art of Romir Bearden. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Shinoda. Thank you all. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you to the folks at the CSREA and to you, Lisa and Mary Kim and Erica and Anongo. It's good to be here. Um, I was thinking a bit about the topic and it made me go back into my work um, in a way I otherwise may not have. So I'm going to read a few short poems. I'm going to begin with an old one that is 22 years old at this point. Um, yeah. After the World Trade Center is destroyed, America waves its true flag, the crimson brown men's blood. For Adil Karas, murdered September 16, 2001. Air and water are the only consolations now. Fire adulterated by the tip of a gun. We're down in the valley now, saying it was a robbery. They took no money, shot him, called him dead in their ignorance, as if a gun could kill. Down in the valley. There was a getaway car and no money, just the laughter from speeding windows. They rid America of one more, or so they thought. My brother, our faces have been stolen and we are dry like the soil that starves its children, withering the crops as they reach for sustenance. Down in the valley, original of the Nile, but in this place called America, we are all brown, unified by being objectified. I call now for rebellion, rebellion like the hand reaching for what it cannot hold, the child whose dignity is greater than her beating, to survive beyond the soil, to see beyond yourself, believing only one. My brother, who has left this world too soon, I will reclaim your face from down in this valley and bring it wrapped in myrrh to your children who wear it well. A note found in the tomb, the tomb of Tutankhamun for the British Museum. Possessor, ignorant of the converse, one geology cancel another, one past haunt another. You who does not understand that our speech is prayer. When every arrow of my body shoots towards heaven, the hieroglyph of my spine made run through my front. Shattered in the folds of my hand, a young boy I was, rested to this place to be one with Ra. They took me to the valley at Thebes, piece my soul from tomb robbers, hidden, eternity, sealed with the doctrine of eternal existence. Now you have unsettled the cataract of the Nile and disturbed the very sun that shields you. Hard-headed Brit, did five attempts to steal me not warn you? White man, always to himself, a hero. Howard Carter, tomb robber, take the sterling from your lord. You cannot buy yourself eternity. This life was never material. Who believes, believes. Impotent in your knowledge, Beast, grave robber, blinded by primitive massacre, unable to not know how, why was never enough. Unbeliever, alive in my death mask, eternally a cobra, I am become my own protector. What am I to do in these strange times? Three thousand years I lay whole, shrouded in my new name, lay distant from the heresy, and you who unwrap me, make my bones degenerate for a glimpse. Think yourself worthy of my touch, unable to embrace mystery. I sing the song chorused by palm fronds and wind. You have missed the message. You have not seen everlasting. I'll read two more poems. This poem is uh, written for a man by the name of Hamza al-Din, who was born in 1929, died in 2006. He was a Nubian musician 
an ethnomusicologist who uh, grew up in, in a Nubian village in Upper Egypt and later wound up teaching ethnomusicology at Berkeley, was a master oud musician um, whose music and compositions have been a, an incredible inspiration to my own work, but are just really quite lovely. And, and there are several allusions to titles of his tracks in, in the poem, um, which you, know, you don't need to know, but they're there. Nile Procession for Hamza al -Din. Never created ourselves, so praise be to the ancestors who show us wisdom in the tantamount night. When the water line breaks from shore, raise our heads to the subjugated flowering of the lotus that never closes. Keeps a reminder like your silence. Tells us you are where you should be, brushing with the skin of a tree. If the bird of peace were to rise from Earth's ashes, could we hear her song like we hear yours? Will the village rhythm match the beat of the donkey's click? Or have we only one song left to sing? Your village was hung by the noose of modernity, drowned her ancestral dust to birth concrete and artificial light. How many pieces of Africa must be scattered and burned, drowned and hung before the world can hear your songs? You curved the aged wood of your oud into a never-ending Nile, made your hands her cataracts, elevated our inner ear. You sing paramhat from the green of your lungs, each note a furrow, a wish, placed in the agricultural tome of epic memory. I'll close with a poem from a recently published book book's called The Way of the Earth, and this poem is called An Afternoon in July. Thunder cracks open the July afternoon like the throat of a frightened child. Tethered stars let loose to a crackling sky, the wet drooping of the fried egg tree bowing in a sheltering silence from another American terror. A birdless sky flooding the hope they love so much to speak of, drowning the blackness of day, sheets of rain blurring our vision. We can almost see another way, the parable of the dead and the green shoots of life. We tack the perforated edges of history to our fading memories while imagining nation in a false light. One neighbor waves from the car, the other from the porch. They do not know one another. I cannot speak to a healing steeped in fictional possibility, but I can speak of a calculation laid bare by the entrails of history. The rain pounds harder and the water breaks free, the veins of the leaves rushing to a nearby stem. An unmoored boat pushed by the stirring swells, an odd and bitter nourishment in the wake of the dead. What does America mean to you? Either I am not you, or there is no meaning. The question itself another torrent, and the flapping of flags, the blood, cold, and ocean sky. We are drowning in that ocean, reaching for the sky, and they claim their freedom so freely, while those who died by them die again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Up next, it's my honor to introduce Erica Hunt, a poet and essayist. She is the author of six collections of poetry, the most recent of which is Jump the Clock, published in 2020 by Night Boat Books, recipient of awards from the Foundation of Contemporary Arts, the Degessere Foundation? Jurassi Foundation, yep, mm -hmm. should have asked. <laughs> the Jurassi Foundation and the Foundation for Poetry. Hunt has given the uh, George Oppen Lecture at San Francisco State University, the Holloway Lecture, and reading at UC Berkeley, and has been a visiting fellow at the Center for Poetry and Contemporary Writing at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good afternoon, um, and thank you so much for the invitation to read 
for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in the Americas. I think this is my second time. Um, I'm going to read from Veronica, uh, which is a sweet next part it published just shortly before Jump the Clock. Uh, it took a long time to write uh, because it's basically a series of elegies. Um, I've been kind of mulling over as many black Americans uh, about the acquittal of George Zimmerman uh, for murdering uh, Trayvon Martin, and I have to say my adult children um, look exactly like Trayvon Martin. So uh, I had to think about what my poetic response would be, and it was just painful to even kind of go there. Finally, I had a dream about a person named Veronica, which someone pointed out is an anagram of my own name. And uh, I was able to speak to Veronica, who then became sort of my alter ego. So these poems are addressed or variously about Veronica. It took a long time to sort of deal with it, but here it is. Context is all. This me. No, not that me, that them. No, the other them, that we. Or this we, all of we. Both of them and all of we when there, not here, but here, in that sense. Oh, Jesus, light. In that sense, me then, before them, before we, when we, have we, that we, for we, when we, spoke, then. Someone matching your description. You wake me up, Veronica, to escort you through the door to the unknown. I am slapped awake and paperless. My eyeglasses somewhere abandoned on the ledge, startled, a tongue triggered dry, staring into eyes emptied of the exact shape of memory, of mercy. You, Veronica, are beside yourself, your face a burned down house. Count me in. I'll walk with you, Veronica, though you are mostly alone and even dry-eyed at the funeral. Who could shake longing to take the place of a child about to be buried? Being of two minds is not enough. When Jacob wrestled with an angel, I wonder who is wrestling with me or you to argue reasonable doubt when I know they never leave their guns. They carry them everywhere into churches and courtrooms. They put scare quotes around the world. They are never mistaken. There are no words for mistake, no reason for indefinite register. There are no words for mistake, no obvious thread that binds the master to the missing supply of mastery. Even sleeping history's abolished fictions live absent the bigot, whose afterthought is our undermine, just knowing what is known from before and knowing what the, know, what the owners of copious knowing know without speaking and say, without saying exactly, be my scapegoat, be my sex toy, be my replenished cargo, my bowl of candy, my profit center of terror, my margin of error, my inevitable extinction, my chronic condition for which there is no escape and never any doubt. Ghost names. Veronica, whose ghost name is Vita, wept to be a grandmother at 35, for don't stones desire to be touched? Veronica, whose ghost name was Yvette, who other girls lay in wait to fight every day, bitten by one fierce girl while the other girls laughed, so out of body, they never noticed the bites scarring their own bituminous skin. Veronica, whose ghost name was Evelyn, was murdered by her husband, for even a rock wants to dance and not be hurled and broken, orphaning their children and children's children. Veronica, whose name was Henrietta, brought from Antigua, 
at 16 to warm a stone of a man about three times her age, and she outlived him and her seven children. Veronica, whose ghost name is Martha, whose rage and martyrdom turned her arms into resting missiles, all knew never to cross. V sticks out like a battered peace sign over an impatient heart that cannot bear the beating or another catastrophe, but in the forehead showed always shoved always out of some out of nowhere, pulled in the reins of female obedience are killing us. That's pretty angry. <laughs> uh, see. I'll read broken English and then maybe one more after that. Broken English, Veronica, a lamentation. <coughs> Wound up in words, is wounded, re-wounded, rewound, rewinding, repeating, re, 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 re seeding, re, 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 inscribing, re, Inflicting, re inserting, re beating, and re suffocating the p p p p p breathing, grieving, bulleted p p p p body on repeat. Wounding. <sighs> Reading into a steady, steady, steady now, steady, steady, steady now, steady, steady, or not. Ready, 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 ready. ready. All red or not red, red, broken, broken syllables, detachment. It's not, it's not, it's not better, better. Remember, it's not better, and it. Ren, 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 -ters. it Ren, -ters. speech, speechless, ah, uh, ten, a uh, ten, derness, something else to be afraid of, strips, kindred, kindling, into broken states, render, render, rendering, illegible and unintelligible, where blackness is suppressed by laws, severed tongues, in to cower us and scowl us dead, mute. Yet she, I, to speak all at once the thing that has been on her my mind, which words, verbs, recover dignity, restores her letters to the unmuffled, unmuzzled fullness, full-throated wound, full-throated sound, 
as in some bodied. The deadlines teach the proper order of time, words, zones of property, properties, intention, returns me, her, day after day to variations of the question, how to breathe freely despite shackle, rattle, and pummeled jolts. Where does glass, where does glare recede? When do words lead to care? Layered sight, out of sight, a path to better resist. Last poem, What Paradise? A poem in an alternate reality. <laughs> we tent ourselves in bittersweet, the more to I brow you, dear, for we know we are cherished for a positive outlook with a hint of candor if the correct tests are met and the results hidden. Let them entrap me with fastidious curtain calls. Expect me to spectacle wrapped in the film version in which they have gotten themselves high marks. Their gems are all in their pockets. Happy, happy snapshots, captive moments, insecurity and retail. Telegraph the same, the semi-public engines driving desire away from prosperity and unreachable outpost. But let me tell you, the rubber meets the scree and slides us back into the lobby, a labyrinth of dumbo-weighted regrets. Inadmissible in most courts, it's not long before it occurs to us that no angel plays a harp that way. Implacably impatient, and maybe we're too close to the mic like we are way over our heads. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ah, it's fun to be the moderator, man. <laughs> Last but not least, please join me in welcoming to the stage Inongo Lumumba Kason. Kasongo. Inongo Lumumba Kasongo, a.k.a. Samus, is a black feminist rap artist and beat maker from Ithaca, New York, with Ivorian and Congolese family roots. She's released six albums and countless collaborations. At Brown, she teaches classes on rap songwriting and feminist sound studies. She's the community outreach chair for the Keeper Project, a digital humanities project documenting the contributions of women and girls to hip hop. Her current research explores the evolution of her revision praxis as a songwriter and discourses surrounding rap performance and AI. <laughs> um, cool, so I'm gonna do um, one piece that's not totally memorized and then I'm gonna show um, footage from uh, that was captured by an audience member at a performance that I found when I was looking for something else. Um, and it is my favorite performance I've, I've ever had and I recognize this after watching it through the form of this person's kind of grainy cell phone footage. Um, and it gives you a sense of what it's like when I'm rhyming for real. Um, so this first piece is called um, Oh My God. Everything feel tenuous. We can barely tell what's up ahead of us. Only like 10 of us can afford more than our tenements built on native settlements while racists will defend our flags but vote against the betterment of our veterans and the rest of us defend against the elements. Depending on other broke folks who are generous, so I hope those who this benefits can understand the locus of our animus, how hopeless and unfair it is, how broken are the hopes in our inheritance. We curl up with some anime and smoke a lot of cannabis, hurting for a better day, blowing off the analysts 
us and their evidence. They may take it as arrogance, but we know that our parents just don't understand the scale of our impediments. We're loaded up with parabens while passing stores and glancing at outlandish clothes on mannequins, a president who brandishes an ego like Zap Brannigan's. No wonder why this manages to yield souls in Americans more cynical than Anakin's. And when we want Wahala, then they block us. They don't want no raucous. They're fossils fueling toxins. They are thoughtless. They promise that it's progress, while costs are more colossal than colossus. Our jobs they hold us hostage, it exhausts us. Our bosses are dishonest. They taunt us with their watches while they watch us and flog us if we come bearing our crosses. They will not cover hospitals or doctors, but tell us that they care because they serve beer and lots of tapas at the office. And Nazis want to constantly accost us. Their posses want to dox us for our causes. And we don't often get no time to process all the losses. We just have to plot along, no pauses, whisper, oh my gods and oh my goshes. I try to nurture every thought that blossoms, but one of my most reoccurring thoughts is, how is it of all possible options, we got to the synopsis where the fate of all that ever was is hanging in the pause of a proboscis. Okay, I'll play the piece. So I wrote the second to last song after a therapist uh, that I started seeing told me that I needed to put into words all of the things that I had been too scared, too ashamed, too stressed to say out loud after I had tried to eradicate myself from this planet. As I mentioned, I'm working on my PhD and uh, no, no, big mistake. Uh, and luckily I'm on the other side of some bullshit. I'm, I'm about to graduate again. a great place a few years ago, um, and the relationship that I was in, the bottom of it just sort of dropped out, um, and then I really tried to eliminate myself, and by the grace of God, I had parents around me and uh, friends who didn't want to see that happen. They took me to get the help that I needed. They brought me to the hospital. They saved me from myself, and uh, I wanted to share my testimony with you in case you're in a space where you need to hear that it's okay to not be okay. So this is a track called 1080p, and I
I want more. Forget home, so I'll go, B. I was taking pills up in the bathroom. Ended up alone in grad school. Amari, yo, I busted ass for my prize of sitting in another castle in a tight spot trying to disappear. I would write songs for my friends to hear. I'm trying to keep my lights on. I'm a Nikon. Now it's crystal clear. Opportunity is at my doorstep. So I'm moving back up on the horse like it's the first time I ever wore specs. I do my thing like my sorority shit. I see things nobody sees since my B sings turns to double D's. I'm conceding that my Where's the fun in that? Gotta live it up, or you will never love. Life's a box of chocolates with a lot of options. You got it. I keep it rocking like a rubber pack. The first letter of your first name makes your name emerge when I search things. And it hurts me, but I guarantee that without you, I'm a better me. And now I see the past with some clarity. Thank God I took my ass to some therapy! Thank you. Um, Stephanie, about how much time do we have? Half hour or a half hour? Okay. Well, I knew it was going to be a powerful afternoon. And it is, I don't know how other people are feeling, but it's been a powerful afternoon um, for me. Can I, uh, actually, I'm going to, I'm diverting from the script just a little bit to say, um, does anyone have like a word that they would use to um, describe how they are feeling having um, heard the poets on stage share their work so far before we move into this other kind of conversation? Grateful? I'm gonna repeat for people on, on Zoom, grateful. Anyone else on this side? I'm coming for y'all in a minute. Heart-wrenching. Understood. Folks on this side, is there a, a word that you might share, put into the space that begins to get out, encapsulate, responds to, shares how you are feeling now? Mellifluous. <laughs> From online, we got moved, heard, and seen. Thank you. Thank you, online community. Appreciate y'all. Um, I, yeah, I feel, I feel heavy. Um, I also, I'm feeling a great sense of gratitude for your individual and collective willingness to tell the hard stories about human life and experience. Um, I think part of the reason I'm saying that is because I think we live in a time of, we do live in a time in which um, people, there's so many lies about what it means to live we are told so many lies. There's so much misinformation, disinformation. And I don't just mean like in the political sphere, but that we really don't often have, I think people often do not have um, real conversations about what's going on with them, that we struggle to find words. And so um, 
to be in the presence of people who have been doing that work and so willing to share it with others is just really powerful. Um, can we perhaps start with um, the, uh, a word response from each one of you to each other's work, or, or shall I ask an easier question about how, who was your first poet, uh, teacher of poetry? What would you prefer? What are you, what are you feeling like? Oh, can you use the mic? Sorry, because I, I know just people online are gonna need help to hear. Thank you. Uh, I was only gonna say that my note page for Anango is just thank God I took my ass to some therapy because I want the t-shirt of that, I want the poster, <laughs> the bumper sticker, <laughs> the billboard. Thank you, yeah. Other responses to each other's work? Um, I'm not sure what the word is. Um, even though we all work with words, I feel like sometimes I, I can't access the word. But I'm just thinking about how in, incredible it is that we were just chopping it up like, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes ago. And now I feel like I know you all in a completely different register. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really enjoyed getting to experience your interiority through this process, what you chose to speak about and how you read and um, your whole kind of presence. It allows me to feel closer to you all, even folks I just met. I feel really close, I think is the word. I want to build on that because it's true. I always say that when I feel that's true, that when I hear people read, I never read your work printed on the same way. I always have some, you know, tune, some sound of their voice in those words. So performance is very important to the kind of unfolding of a text. Text is just one thing, but then you hear them and you go, oh my goodness, that's what they sound like. Like Matthew, I've never heard you. I've never heard anybody read. Maybe I've heard you read one again. But definitely that was different. Yeah, I think I, I the word you used, the Nango is interiority. And I think that I was struck by the vulnerability. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it is, I mean, it's one of the things I go to art for is to, to, to get that sense of interiority from people and to, to really kind of see how folks lay bare themselves on the page or the stage in, in one way or another. So I appreciate that after a day of institutional engagement, you know. I also, uh, I've just been thinking a lot about the particular you know, since um, we were all virtual for so long, the particularities of the energy and dynamics of a moment. And Inango, your performance at the end allowed me to just think about everything that had come before in a different way. Like I saw, you know, it was almost as if the, the areas of vulnerability and the areas of rage sort of bubbled up again in, you know, after and during your performance. And there was something um, that I found just really amazing about that particular interaction of these people, these voices, these gestures at this moment. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was uh, in your work, Mary Kim, was this this kind of dialogue between the image and the text? Because the the words were different on the screen, and you were reading something else. And um, I thought that was really interesting. And um, I began to think they were not the same voice. That one was, you know, one voice and that what was appearing on the screen was something else, the images of war. And um, 
in various ways, I think each of the writers, we all try to deal bravely with something, you know, that's hard. Um, and, you know, use different strategies for, like, how do you confront something that's difficult, you know? And sometimes it's to have a dialogue with it. Sometimes it's very cathartic to sort of step into, you know, the full emotion and let it fill. Um, sometimes it's, um, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to characterize it. Too. I, I'm doing that teaching thing, but <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but, uh, 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 you know, sometimes it's kind of like a defiance, like that last poem you read, Matthew, was like a, you know, I'm telling you about something you don't know. And I know about you, America. You know? We, well, <laughs> sure, for sure. <laughs> That's for sure. But that, the, so there's different strategies for that. Um, it's not Pax Americana. There's an unsettlement. You know, the uns, un, un, it's not settled. <laughs> Turbulence. And um, I just want to notice that. I think I was also, I was really struck by, I guess, um, how each one of your work was, I mean, you're sharing something um, that's important to you in the moment, but that also, um, I don't know, it struck me as like a practice, a deep practice of care for self, I mean, I mean um, and for community and for others, even others who are not in the room, wouldn't, would turn their back on what you have to offer, would deny the truth, deny reality, people have have treated us like crap. Um, that that um, that one. So I, that's what struck me. I was wondering: does is is that part of what your experience is as you have been delving into writing poetry? I don't know how long you've been writing poetry. I, I'm going to work my way back to that question about um, about teachers and whether or not. Um, Poetry as a practice of care was part of what you were taught as you were learning to to write, or if it's something that came in a kind of a different medium. I'm thinking about your story um, in particular, that entreaty to to write. Um, but I, I I wondered if that um, that entreaty to write uh, came what mediums, what teachers it, it came through, if, if any at all, or if it's something that, you know, spirit said to you, we're going to do this, we're on board, and using you kind of as the, the, the yeah, like the medium. So I don't know if that's a generative question, but that's what I got. Sorry, people. <laughs> so. It's a great question. Okay. <laughs> um, I can start. So... Um, just in terms of the idea about like uh, kind of care work um, involved in the practice of writing, I think um, initially for me, I mean like for real, for real, I started rapping in part because I was a, a fourth grade math and science teacher and at the time. And I was already making beats, but I was kind of like too scared to rhyme and um, my students, they thought I was super boring. They were not into anything that I was doing. So I was like, okay, if I can make rap songs about how it's really cool to study, like maybe they will <laughs> like pay attention to me. And I, so I started making music where I was just like, I'm in the library, it's really cool. And <laughs> like, <laughs> um, please don't look up anything that I made it like, 20, before 2010, I'm gonna like pull it down tonight. But, um, and then I was too scared to show it to the students because kids are ruthless. But I showed it to my friends and 
I think what they saw in me is kind of what I gravitated towards in figures like Issa Rae, who developed Awkward, Awkward Black Girl. And it was this kind of black womanhood, girlhood that I kind of was wrestling with for most of my adult life and didn't know what it like meant. So when I, what I think of now in terms of care work is like I want to write music for anxious black girls. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Meg Thee Stallion says like real hot girl shit and I say real fraught girl shit. Like that's <laughs> me. <laughs> um, so it feels like I've been able to build community through that and find a voice and have language for I think like the aesthetics of anxiety, which like permeates so much of what it means to be alive in this moment and to particularly occupy the bodies that we do. So I hope that that comes out in the performance and in the form itself, like how I structure songs, but also just the kind of like material of it is designed to speak to my, speak back to myself and to speak to all of the folks who I think would characterize themselves in that way. Um, I'm not I'm not sure that I still remember the question, but what I was thinking about when you were um, speaking was um, the experience of growing up non-white in a white family, in a white community, in white schools um, created this profound disjunction and for me um, writing about it which was you know could remain somewhat private could remain uh, I didn't need to rely on anyone responding to it or anything it was for me and it was a way to address that irreconcilable disjunction of an interiority that was not reflected back to me in any way both in terms of race, but also in terms of um, sort of a developing sense of uh, self or agency or, you know, and this is a slight diversion, but because therapists are, have been invoked in the room <laughs> and because my dearest, dearest Bonnie is also in the room, I was thinking of you this morning when in my own therapy, I came to this recognition about, you know, I've spent an entire life trying to express something that was shut down, denied, dismissed. And that is crazy making. Um, so, and, and yet, you know, and yet my proximity to whiteness, my education, uh, all of the access that I've had gave me a kind of language that again didn't sit well with what I was trying to express. So I think all of my work arises from that tension of um, being ill at ease in body, language, space, life. <laughs> and so in that sense, writing the way I'm writing now and about what I'm writing now is a kind of caretaking for uh, my baby self hopefully Bonnie's baby self and all the baby selves that need it. <laughs> no, I think I, I write to figure out what I know um, or what I think about something. Um, I, uh, I don't know, I, uh, yeah, I've been writing since I was could write. I have journals from when I was 15 years old. That was a long time ago. Pretty much continuously writing. Uh, I'm also a nonconform. I was early nonconformist. I don't like to, you know. So it's like an anti-authoritarian thing <laughs> that I have that I've now learned to like shape a little bit so that I can fit inside things. <laughs> um, uh, but also, I think early on, a, a visceral and sort of internal um, passion, distaste for 
things that I consider to be unjust. I mean, it can really, I can get really worked up. And, um, and before this context, I uh, uh, spent 25 years in social justice organizations. So, and uh, became a leader in that respect. So yeah, it's like I, I, can, I can move on that, work on that. So writing is both for thinking, but it's also for um, hopefully pulling people together in a, in a kind of way and sort of saying, okay, we've done that and it hasn't worked, so now can we please try something new? Let's innovate. Let's, I mean, some of my writing is about pushing people's assumptions about what a poem should look like. And uh, part of that is because I think writing is a tool um, to push and change paradigms, concepts, frames. Um, yeah, so I am, yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little heady. <laughs> I'm a little heady. And, um, but I also am passionate about uh, things that just don't seem fair or right or that are cruel, just cruel. And why do we have to live that way? Yeah, I, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think for me, though the act of writing and poetry is largely a solitary act at times, I feel very fortunate that I, I came up through poetry and community. There were always people around me and I was always very interested in engaging the work of others, whether that be other poets, musicians, other, other folks. And so for me, that, that notion of care, which is deeply linked to community for me, is inherent in my thinking about this work. It's always been there and I feel very, very fortunate, as I've said about that, that there's, you know, that whether it be elder poets, peer poets, there were always a group of folks who were engaging the work, who were serious about, you know, teaching me, mentoring me, um, thinking through things. And so that, that for, so those, I can't, I can't disaggregate that. And then there's a cultural piece to this that, you know, I, you know, at a fundamental level, I don't really believe in the individual. Um, I mean, it took me several books to really use the pronoun I. Um, and it, it's, you know, this is a, a kind of cultural framework of envisioning the world not as an individual, um, but as a human being who is part of a collective, which again, to me, is an inherent relationship with care, right? Um, and I won't go into, you know, critiques of notions of self-care, which I don't really have real critiques of, but you know, even that, that idea of the self, if it's envisioned only in an individualistic frame, I think is, is something I struggle with, right? Care is an inherent part of a symbiotic relationship with community, right? And, and I see all art, but certainly for me, poetry is, is an extension of that, um, you know, my students don't always love this, but I, I, don't, I don't believe that we write for ourselves. I've never believed that. I think we're writing for, even if it's an imagined audience, another group of humans that we imagine outside of ourselves, that we're in conversation with others. Um, again, whether they're real or not, that doesn't really matter to me, but you know, I think we're, we're engaging something outside of the self. And I think that I, you know, I pay a lot of attention to that. It's important. So thank you. God, I have to do the time check. Okay, we have about 15 minutes. Um, let me open up things to the audience here or the audience online. If folks want to use, the, I guess, what is it, the Q&A or the chat function online? You can pop a question in there and they'll be shared with me so I can pose it to the group. But are there any questions in the audience that folks would like to pose? Or I can ask one more and let y'all marinate a little bit. Oh wait, there's a question. There we go, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. 
My name's Victoria. I'm a first year doctoral student in Africana Studies. Um, I really enjoyed everyone's work. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, my question was specifically about broken English. I would love to hear a little bit more about how the poem is like denotated or scribed in the book and how the process of coming up with a performance of it um, came to be. Thank you so much. Uh, broken English is literally broken on the page into syllables. And um, it's this idea that, um, well, yeah, it's taking a hammer to this language uh, and breaking it because um, there's this thing Adorno says that can there be poetry after Auschwitz, right? And can there be poetry? It, or rather, this is the same language that rationalizes white supremacy, patriarchy, bunch of stuff that we could, you know, maybe <laughs> do without or change after, right? And is so resistant. So what do we have to do to this language in order for it to, you know, finally break? So broken English has got that level of, okay, let's take a hammer, see what happens. And can one find any kind of emancipatory or possibility, potentiality for an otherwise inside a language that is often used to um, discipline and contain, you know, what we might want. So it's like, now, it has many roots too in um, Zong which I know half this audience must be familiar with, which is also a kind of breaking of a language. And um, so, as you know, Matthew said, no poet comes up with poems by themselves. We, we feed each other. And, um, but it also has that other piece into Audre Lorde, master's tools, dismantle <laughs> the house. Can you break it? What? So, so there's lots of tributaries into that poem. I, I really love the kind of way you talk about like the physicality of the word and like playing with it in that way. So I was wondering if the other folks, I'd be curious about any sort of uh, strategies or ways that you think about also breaking breaking the word or re, 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 reworking the word. Um, in, in my own experience, I'm fascinated by the slant rhyme, by the possibilities for the slant rhyme. And in the first piece that I did, the, the end rhyme for every single line is, is rhyming. But when you kind of see, I wrote out the words and was studying them this morning, you know, the first word is tenuous and it ends on anakins, which are not, don't really rhyme when you kind of see them side by side, but through this sort of like working over, working over from line to line to line, you can sort of get to this other place. And I'm, I'm really captivated by the, the way that you're sort of repeating, but not, and, <laughs> and what that allow, how that allows you to move through the piece. So I just was curious if other folks might maybe speak about ways that they're breaking or playing with like molding, shaping, um, doing that kind of like, having that like physical relationship with the text. You know, you're speaking of this sonic um, thing, which is the slant and the quarter rhyme and so forth. And what happens is uh, th that sonic repetition, right? Pulling it, pulling it together as syllables and then as it kind of comes apart, um, it's wonderful, right? Yeah, it's, um, and it, it suggests all these possibilities for refiguring what we expect to hear because there were so many unexpected rhymes in what you performed, you know, so, and then kind of going, oh, not that, swerve, <laughs> it's something else, um, yeah. Um, it's a great question. I think 
for me, it's some of why I've um, enjoyed working with visual representations with the spoken text because you know spoken it, it's going in one direction it's it's uh, moving forward in time and there's something about um, being able to show words in ways that are less intelligible that feels very um, you know generative and, and fertile and in um, the sort of absurdity of language can be more easily discerned, I think, in that kind of layering. Um, so that's that's a thing that I've been thinking about a lot. I also, just to go back, Erica, to that poem, I just, it was so, um, I don't know, it was so powerful to have in the same moment this recognition of the possibility of language and its constant shutting down, constant in, you know, in uh, what it couldn't do. <laughs> Did you want to? Or yeah, I, I just briefly. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of fixated on the sonic level of the line and, and the way that language works musically internally within the line. So it's something I pay a lot of attention to. But I think on a, on another level, and this may be part of growing up, you know, with immigrant parents in an immigrant community, I hear. English differently. Um, and, and so I'm always kind of interested in the variations of how English is utilized and how it's malleable in various ways. And I, I've also learned this thing largely through arguments with my wife that I, I often lean towards like the second or third definition of words as the way that I understand language. So we'll, I'll say something and we'll be in the house and just say, that's not what that means. Like, yes, it is, right? And we'll, we'll go to the dictionary and find out she's absolutely right on the primary definition. But, you know, three, three rows down, that's where you find me. Uh, Did we get a, a question from online? Yes. Okay. A question from our Zoom audience. Uh, I'd like to hear about your re revision process. Poetry feels like such an emotive and personal expression. How can you apply a rubric of correctness or doneness to something like that? It's something I struggle to negotiate. A lot of serious head nodding. Man, going on. Mary Kim is having a moment. Do you want to begin <laughs> for us or, or Erica? Yes, go ahead, please. Started back teaching. I really didn't have. I couldn't even describe what revision was. But now it's been asked so often. Now I like had a whole couple of classes on revision, because there's no one way to revise. Is true, you know. There's no one way to revise. Everybody finds their way. But um, what I have kind of settled on is that um, the poem is an approximation or an enactment of an experience. So it's not like there's one way, there's the enactment. This is the thing you're trying to, you know, trying to demonstrate. <laughs> or it's this poem is in some way, has some relationship to an experience or a set of experiences or thoughts. So what's, so you've got there's that heady, wonderful free write period, and then there's like, oh, I gotta revise, you know. What is the structure that helps support the enactment? Like, what is this thing about? You have to ask yourself, what is this about? What, am I, what is it really about? Or maybe it's not about anything. Well, then, therefore, what is the structure of something that's not about, you know? But, so, um, Revision, poets pay attention to words. The third, <laughs> the third, third entry on the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> or the sonic, right? The elements of poetry being image, sound, syntax, feeling, thought, and, you know, lineation. So each of those things can be tweaked 
not all of them equally, but some of them. So that's that's like that's the, that's my <laughs> shorthand on revision. There's lots to say because everybody revises differently. It's so many different ways to to do it. But if you think of the poem as being particular, to and you know some something you know an enactment of something, it's supposed to impress in its reception, leave some kind of impression on the audience. Um, I, was, I was nodding because, uh, let's see, this is maybe not a very like, helpful response, but, you know, and I, I have certainly facilitated revision workshops, I have revision handouts, I, you know, I can answer certain things in a certain way that I don't actually use. So, but what I have been thinking about more recently is, you know, the way, and, and Erica, maybe this is, is part of what you're saying as well, that it's an enactment of, a, of a, an experience in a moment, and I've been thinking more about the iterations of the way a work is at a particular moment or the process of it, you know, getting air, which would be interacting in a room as, um, as sort of part of the process. So the idea of revision becomes less, slightly less um, relevant to me and the sort of evolution or iteration becomes more so. Um, and you know that may be my way of getting out of the revision checklist, but. Everybody's bodies. You watch everybody's bodies react <laughs> to the poem, and you go, "Oh, oh, they didn't get my joke," or, "Oh, that wasn't," you know, and that also is feedback about whether you know. Nothing like reading it out loud for yourself or with others. Yeah. What were you going to say? You, yeah. I think for me, for, um, I'm struggling with this right now. Um, but I think for for earlier works, there was a there's always been a kind of urgency in the writing, um, in part because you know when I was releasing a lot of work, I was in a PhD program, so it was like okay, summer, I have to release something for the summer, and then I can tour because that's when I'm free. And so I couldn't uh, really afford to be precious about like what I was recording and went like, get it down, just have it and it'll be a trace of this thing that you're interested in and you'll tour the hell out of it and learn how you actually want it to be and regret that you didn't record it that way and move on. <laughs> and like that was kind of the relationship that I have had to recordings. I mean, I, I, um, you know, now being in this space and, and having more resources and more time, I think has actually made my process even more fraught because I, there's an urgency of course, but there's not the sort of, um, like being in a like DIY space where you're touring as your lifeblood and you're, you're actively in community and conversation with folks for putting out material and it doesn't have to be perfect and that's kind of the, like that's it that's the we do it because it's not perfect and um you know I'm, I'm trying to get reconnected with that now because I have felt being here that I um I now have this sort of inclination around perfection so now revision looks like going back in and breaking the things that feel really technically sound but don't have my heart in it like I feel like my first album is my favorite album and it was recorded on a shitty microphone that I bought from the campus store and the songs are mixed terribly but I was just so urgent and I was saying everything I felt and getting it out and I think now I can get in this loop around uh, perfection and so I think about the words of uh, Jaylen who's an incredible uh, producer um, and she says, precision, not perfection. And I just, like, probably will get that tattooed on me at some point <laughs> to just work that over and over again as I'm going through my process. Like, precision, pre be precise with what you want to say. But perfection is not what, what I'm aiming for. I have to constantly remind myself of that. Beautiful. Thank you. Are there's, uh, we maybe have time for one. Nope. 
I'm getting the cut sign. So I will instead invite audience members to, um, to, um, to speak with, to introduce yourself to our fabulous panel of poets, um, and instead wrap up the event by saying thank you to the online audience, thank you to the CSREA, thank you to all of you who have joined us today, and most especially thank you for joining me on stage and for sharing your, your beautiful, thoughtful, insightful, vulnerable, um, truly inspiring work with us all. So, thank you so much. Thank you.